Today is March 22nd. Why does God bless us? Let's find out together as we read Deuteronomy 13 to 16. In our scripture reading today, Moses enters into a period of time for the next four days. We're going to see that there's just a hodgepodge of things that Moses talks about. He jumps from this to that. He's mentioning laws. He's mentioning uh, directives that uh, they are to follow. Uh, We see here in chapter 13, he talks about idolatry. Then he talks about clean and unclean animals. He moves on to talking about tithes, debts, and he ends up talking about festivals. Now, nine times in these chapters, 13 through 16, he uses the word bless. Look, for example, at what he says in chapter 14, verse 29. Um, when When he talks about giving tithes, he says, give your tithe to the Levites, and he goes into why they should do that. But he finishes saying, Then the Lord your God will bless you in all your works. Now, frequently, when he talks about blessing in these chapters, he's talking about uh, things that the Lord has given them, things that the Lord has provided for them. And when he does that, He frequently says, God blesses you so that you can bless others. We started with the question, why does God bless us? He blesses us so that we can bless others. Deuteronomy 13 to 16, New Living Translation, Deuteronomy 13. Suppose there are prophets among you or those who dream dreams about the future and they promise you signs or miracles and the predicted signs or miracles occur. If they then say, come, let us worship other gods, gods you have not known before, do not listen to them. The Lord your God is testing you to see if you truly love him with all your heart and soul. Serve only the Lord your God and fear him alone. Obey his commands, listen to his voice, cling to him. The false prophets or visionaries who try to lead you astray must be put to death, for they encourage rebellion against the Lord your God who redeemed you from slavery and brought you out of the land of Egypt. Since they try to lead you astray from the way the Lord your God commanded you to live, you must put them to death. In this way, you will purge the evil from among you. Suppose someone secretly entices you, even your brother, your son or daughter, your beloved wife, or your closest friend, and says, Let us go worship other gods, gods that neither you nor your ancestors have known. They might suggest that you worship the gods of peoples who live nearby or who come from the ends of the earth. But don't give in to listen. Have no pity. Do not spare. Protect them. You must put them to death. Strike the first blow yourself. Then all the people must join in. Stone the guilty ones to death because they've tried to draw you away from the Lord your God who rescued you from the land of Egypt, the place of slavery. Then all Israel will hear about it and be afraid and no one will act so wickedly again. When you begin living in the towns the Lord your God is giving you, You may hear that scoundrels among you are leading their fellow citizens astray by saying, let us go worship other gods, gods you have not known before. In such cases, you must examine the facts carefully. If you find that the report is true and such a detestable act has been committed among you, you must attack that town and completely destroy all its inhabitants as well as all the livestock. Then you must pile all the plunder in the middle of the open square and burn it. Burn the entire town as a burnt offering to the Lord your God. 
That town must remain a ruin forever. It may never be rebuilt. Keep none of the plunder that's been set aside for destruction. Then the Lord will turn from his fierce anger and be merciful to you. He'll have compassion on you and make you a large nation, just as he swore to your ancestors. The Lord your God will be merciful only if you listen to his voice and keep all his commands that I'm giving you today, doing what pleases him. Deuteronomy 14. Since you're the people of the Lord your God, never cut yourselves or shave the hair above your foreheads in mourning for the dead. You've been set apart as holy to the Lord your God, and he has chosen you from all the nations of the earth to be his own special treasure. You must not eat any detestable animals that are ceremonially unclean. These are the animals that you may eat, the ox, the sheep, the goat, the deer, the gazelle, the roe deer, the wild goat, the adax, the antelope, and the mountain sheep. You may eat any animal that has completely split hooves and chews the cud. But if the animal doesn't have both, it may not be eaten. So you may not eat the camel, the hare, or the hyrax. They chew the cud, but do not have split hooves, so they are ceremonially unclean for you. You may not eat the pig. It has split hooves, but does not chew the cud, so it is ceremonially unclean for you. You may not eat the meat of these animals or even touch their carcasses. Of all the marine animals, you may eat whatever has both fins and scales. You may not, however, eat marine animals that do not have both fins and scales. They are ceremonially unclean for you. You may eat any bird that is ceremonially clean. These are the birds that you may not eat. The griffin vulture, the bearded vulture, the black vulture, the kite, the falcon, buzzards of all kinds, ravens of all kinds, the eagle owl, the short-eared owl, the seagull, hawks of all kinds, the little owl, the great owl, the barn owl, the desert owl, the Egyptian vulture, the cormorant, the stork, herons of all kinds, the hopo and the bat. All winged insects that walk along the ground are ceremonially unclean for you and may not be eaten. But you may eat any winged bird or insect that is ceremonially unclean. You must not eat anything that has died a natural death. You may give it to a foreigner living in your town or you may sell it to a stranger, but do not eat it yourselves for you're set apart as holy to the Lord your God. You must not cook a young goat in its mother's milk. You must set aside a tithe of your crops, one-tenth of all the crops you harvest each year. Bring this tithe to the designated place of worship, the place the Lord your God chooses for his name to be honored. You eat it there in his presence. This applies to your tithes of grain, new wine, olive oil, the firstborn males of your flocks and herds. Doing this will teach you always to fear the Lord your God. Now when the Lord your God blesses you with a good harvest, the place of worship he chooses for his name to be honored might be too far for you to bring a tithe. If so, you may sell the tithe portion of your crops and herds. Put the money in a pouch. Go to the place the Lord your God has chosen, and when you arrive... You may use the money to buy any kind of food you want, cattle, sheep, goats, wines, or other alcoholic drink. Then feast there in the presence of the Lord your God and celebrate with your household. And do not neglect the Levites in your town, for they'll receive no allotment of land among you. At the end of every third year, bring the entire tithe of that year's harvest and store it in the nearest town. Give it to the Levites, who will receive no allotment of land among you, as well as to the foreigners living among you, the orphans, the widows in your towns, so they can eat and be satisfied. Then the Lord your God will bless you in all your work. Deuteronomy 15. At the end of every seventh year, you must cancel the debts of everyone who owes you money. 
This is how it must be done. Everyone must cancel the loans that they've made to their fellow Israelites. They must not demand payment from their neighbors or relatives, for the Lord's time of release has arrived. This release from debt, however, applies only to your fellow Israelites, not to the foreigners living among you. There should be no poor among you, for the Lord your God will greatly bless you in the land he's giving you as a special possession. You'll receive this blessing if you're careful to obey all the commands of the Lord your God that I'm giving you today. The Lord your God will bless you as he has promised. You will lend money to many nations, but will never need to borrow. You will rule many nations, but they will not rule over you. But if there are any poor Israelites in your towns when you arrive in the land the Lord your God is giving you, do not be hard-hearted or tight-fisted toward them. Instead, be generous and lend them whatever they need. Don't be mean-spirited and refuse someone alone because the year for canceling debts is close at hand. If you refuse to make the loan and the needy person cries out to the Lord, you'll be considered guilty of sin. Give generously to the poor, not grudgingly, for the Lord your God will bless you in everything you do. There will always be some in the land who are poor. That's why I'm commanding you to share freely with the poor and with other Israelites in need. If a fellow Hebrew sells himself or herself to be your servant and serves you for six years, in the seventh year you must set that servant free. When you release a male servant, don't send him away empty-handed. Give, her a, give him a generous farewell gift from your flock, your threshing floor, and your wine press. Share with him some of the bounty with which the Lord your God has blessed you. Remember that you were once slaves in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God redeemed you. That's why I'm giving you this command. But suppose your servant says, I will not leave you because he loves you and your family and he's done well with you. In that case, take an awl and push it through his earlobe into the door. After that, he'll be your servant for life. Do the same with your female servants. You must not consider it a hardship when you release your servants. Remember that for six years they've given you services worth double the wages of hired workers, and the Lord your God will bless you in all you do. You must set aside for the Lord your God all the firstborn males from your flocks and herds. Don't use the firstborn of your herds to work your fields. Don't shear the firstborn of your flocks. Instead, you and your family must eat these animals in the presence of the Lord your God each year at the place he chooses. But if this firstborn animal has any defects such as lameness or blindness, or if anything else is wrong with it, you must not sacrifice it to the Lord your God. Instead, use it for food for your family in your hometown. Anyone, whether ceremonially clean or unclean, may eat it, just as anyone may eat a gazelle or deer. But you must not consume the blood. You must pour it out on the ground like water. Deuteronomy 16. In honor of the Lord your God, celebrate the Passover each year in the early spring in the month of Abib, for that was the month in which the Lord your God brought you out of Egypt by night. Your Passover sacrifice may be from either the flock or the herd, and it must be sacrificed to the Lord your God at the designated place of worship, the place he chooses for his name to be honored. Eat it with bread made without yeast. For seven days, the bread you eat must be made without yeast, as when you escaped from Egypt in such a hurry. Eat this bread, the bread of suffering, so that as long as you live, you'll remember the day you departed from Egypt. Let no yeast be found in any house throughout the land for those seven days. And when you sacrifice the Passover land on the evening of the first day, don't let any of the meat remain until the next morning. You may not sacrifice the Passover in just any of the towns that the Lord your God is giving you. You must offer it only at the designated place of worship, the place the Lord your God chooses for his name to be honored. Sacrifice it there in the evening as the sun goes down on the anniversary of your exodus from Egypt. Roast the lamb and eat it in the place the Lord your God chooses. Then you may go back to your tents the next morning. 
For the next six days, you may not eat any bread made with yeast. On the seventh day, proclaim another holy day and honor the Lord your God, and no work may be done on that day. Count off seven weeks from the time you first begin to cut the grain at the time of harvest. Then celebrate the festival of harvest to honor the Lord your God. Bring him a voluntary offering in proportion to the blessings you have received from him. This is a time to celebrate before the Lord your God at the designated place of worship. He will choose for his name to be honored. Celebrate with your sons and daughters, your male and female servants, the Levites from your towns, and the foreigners, orphans, and widows who live among you. Remember that you were once slaves in Egypt, so be careful to obey all these decrees. You must observe the festival of shelters for seven days at the end of the harvest season, after the grain has been threshed and the grapes have been pressed. This festival will be a happy time of celebrating with your sons and daughters, your male and female servants, and the Levites, foreigners, orphans, and widows from your towns. For seven days, you must celebrate this festival to honor the Lord your God at the place he chooses. For it's he who blesses you with bountiful harvests and gives you success in all your work. This festival will be a great time of joy for all. Each year, every man in Israel must celebrate these three festivals, the festival of unleavened bread, the festival of harvest, and the festival of shelters. On each of these occasions, all men must appear before the Lord your God at the place he chooses, but they must not appear before the Lord without a gift for him. All must give as they are able, according to the blessings given to them by the Lord your God. Appoint judges and officials for yourselves from each of your tribes and all the towns the Lord your God is giving you. They must judge the people fairly. You must never twist justice or show partiality. Never accept a bribe, for bribes blind the eyes of the wide and corrupt the decisions of the godly. Let true justice prevail, so you may live and occupy the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You must never set up a wooden asherah pole beside the altar you build for the Lord your God. And never set up sacred pillars for worship, for the Lord your God hates them. Like, follow, and subscribe to this devotional on whatever platform you use to listen to it. Email your questions to us at questions at becomehope.com. Tomorrow, we'll look at our Messiah, a prophet like Moses.